at parent circle dr laura we meet a lot of parents we have an outreach program to help parents um, you know uh, talk about the importance of the role they play in the lives of their children right how important parenting is that's something we want to make parents aware of and also talk about positive or as you would say peaceful parenting solutions to parents but one question that we often get asked is what's this new thing about parenting didn't we all just grow up right didn't we and we are all just fine is there really a need for parenting coach or parenting content i wonder if you also get questions asked in a similar question yes. and how do you respond yes. to something like this you know i really like to know how to tell parents how important it is well we it's true that parents have raised children for you know as long as humans have been around but we haven't um always known anything about child development and what was appropriate for children right we haven't always allowed children to or nur- nurtured children so that they could become their very best selves we sometimes you know i mean generations ago we didn't know anything about it and we science has learned so many things over the last even 30 years 3 decades since parents were growing up we've learned about child development we've learned about brain development now we've learned in many other fields too we know how to do surgeries that we couldn't do even 30 years ago right and we've benefited from the science we've learned about how to build safer cars than we did 30 years ago we benefited from the science and we've learned how to raise children who are healthier and happier and we can benefit from the science with that as well so parents sure we've always raised children but that doesn't mean we've done a fabulous job and you can look around you and you can see that adults well we know that adults are not always happy we're prone to anxiety we're prone to depression we're there are, in the united states there are many adults who are taking various anti anxiety or anti depressant drugs uh medications because they need to for stability um and so i think we we have people who drink too much to self medicate we have people who lose their temper and hit their wife or hit their child um which we know is not helpful to anybody so i'm not sure that the people who the are adults today are necessarily paragons of mental health i think they are trying as hard as they possibly can but i think that we have some healing to do most of us adults from our own childhoods and that we become happier people, better people, better parents when we do that healing. So let's raise children who don't have to do that healing. Let's raise children who can make the most of all of their intelligence and their talents and their gifts with also having emotional intelligence. I'm going to actually start with the the second idea. The second idea is connection. And I'm starting with that because that is 80 or 90% of parenting. Because until we have a relationship with someone where they trust us and they want to follow our guidance and our lead, they won't do what we say. That's true for adults and it's true for children. So if you want your child to cooperate without threats and punishment or bribes or yelling at them. If you want your child to cooperate, you need a relationship of closeness of trust where your child wants to do what you say wants to follow your lead doesn't want to disappoint you because they love you and they're close to you so that's connection and it is as i say maybe guidance and teaching your child is 20% of parenting at most at most 80% of it is that warm connection with your child where you delight in who they are and you have a warm happy affectionate relationship that's one i'm going to talk about coaching next because every child is still a child by definition every child will exhibit childish behavior they and what does that mean sometimes it means they don't know the right th- way to do things they don't know that they i don't know put their feet up on the chair or the couch when they visit their grandmother but 
But sometimes they know, and they do it anyway. And that would drive a parent crazy, right? So why are they doing that? Well, they're doing it because they have some unmet need. In this case, maybe they didn't get to run around outside today, and they're, they're very active because that's how children are. They need to be physical. They need to run around. They need to be outside. So some, maybe that's the need that's unmet. Or sometimes there's some feelings that they need some help with. Maybe they're very angry. Maybe they're angry because someone said no to them. And it might even be that you said no for a good reason. No, no more treats now. It's too close to dinner. It might be a good reason, but you said no, and they're angry at you. So they're trying to show you how angry they are. So they purposely put their foot on their grandmother's chair, right? Which, of course, would make you crazy. But what they need help with there is the feelings. They need help to say to you, I'm so disappointed. I wish I could have more treats. I'm really hungry, right? Instead of saying, I'm mad and I'm going to show you. So when we help children with their feelings... They become able to articulate those feelings. They don't have to act them out by misbehaving, right? And they also, their, their feelings are more under their conscious control. They're more able to regulate themselves and stop themselves from doing things that they, they want to do. We all feel like doing things we shouldn't do, that we know better. As adults, we have a fully developed prefrontal cortex. And even then, we can't always control ourselves very well. But children... Their prefrontal cortex is still developing until age 25, at least, age 25. So we know they can't think ahead. They don't realize the chair will get dirty. They don't realize their grandmother will feel offended. They, they need some help from us to guide them, but they also need some help from us for those feelings so they can manage the feelings appropriately. So that's coaching the child. Because if you just punish them, for putting their foot on her couch or her chair, then they aren't getting help with the feelings. So they're still going to be mis misbehaving, right? Even if they do something else, like throw their food on the floor when they finally get it, they'll still be misbehaving. So we need to help them with the feelings. And now I'm going to circle around to the first thing, mm -hmm. her parents' ability to regulate their own emotions. Because you can see that you can't do these other two things connection and coaching. You can't do them unless you can self-regulate. It's the hardest thing. It's the hardest thing. The child purposely puts their foot on their grandmother's chair and you just want to smack them. Really, most parents are just like, no, you know better than that. You're embarrassed. Your mother-in-law is looking at you. You know your child just did the wrong thing. You're embarrassed. It's very hard to self-regulate. But when we can self-regulate, we learn that we're much better at coaching our children. And also it's the only way to connect with them. When we're yelling, when we're shouting at the child, if we're smacking the child, they're not connecting with us. So they're not open to our guidance, to our influence. So those are the three big ideas. And these are not just my ideas. These are based in the research. The research shows that we have no influence without connection. The research shows that when children are emotion coached, they are better able to self-regulate and cooperate. And the research shows that parents can't do these things without some work on themselves, without learning to regulate their own emotions. First of all, when you realize you're getting annoyed at the child, before you're enraged, when you're just getting annoyed, it's more mild, you, start, you stop and you notice and you say, I've got to stop this before I get too angry. Don't wait. Don't be patient and wait. Instead, notice it, decide you're going to take action, and then the first action you take is to calm your own self. So you, take, you do what I call stop, drop, and breathe. Just stop whatever you're doing. Maybe you were on your phone. Maybe you were talking to another adult, the grandmother, whatever. Drop, stop that, and then drop your agenda. Your agenda at this moment is to go and shout at your child to, to make them stop. But just drop that agenda for one, like for 30 seconds, just for a moment until you calm down. And then breathe. Breathing calms you down because right now when you look at your child jumping on the sofa, you say, it's an emergency. And you go into fight 
flight, or freeze. That's a state of emergency. Well, what does fight, flight, or freeze mean? You fight the robber or the tiger. Well, you don't really fight the tiger. You fight the robber. You run from the tiger, right? Fight, flight. Flight would be running from the tiger. Or freeze. You realize you can't get away from the tiger, so you pretend you're dead, right? That's freeze. So fight, flight, or freeze is what happens when it's a state of emergency. And so when you look at your child and you go into a state of emergency, you're in fight mode. And your child looks like the enemy, and you're ready to fight with them. But what happens when you take a breath? Your body says, oh, it's not really as an emergency. If it were an emergency, she'd be running. She'd be fighting. It's not an emergency. She's breathing. She's taking a deep breath, a calming breath, maybe three deep breaths. And the body says, oh, it's not an emergency after all. We can calm down now. Okay, guys, no more adrenaline. Don't give me any more adrenaline. Shut that off. We're going to calm down now. It's all good. Not an emergency after all. She's breathing deep. So you've given your body the signal to calm down. That helps a lot. Now, you're still pretty annoyed that the child is jumping on the couch. But now your body stops escalating. So that's stop, drop, and breathe. So that's the first thing you do. And then you're moving toward your child. You're moving toward your child. But you remember, my child isn't open to my influence unless I connect first. So your second step is to connect. So you say your child's name, not in a mean way, not in a threatening way, but in a nice way, right? So, so you say, Nitra, to your child, and your child looks up at you, and you say, you are having fun, aren't you? So she looks at you, and she goes, yeah, I'm having fun. Look, I'm jumping. And you say, I know, sweetheart, and, and then you're next to her, and you scoop her up in your arms, and you say, I know you are, and, and you're putting her down, jumping on the couch isn't okay. Jumping on the sofa is not okay. At our house, it's okay. Maybe it is okay at your house, but not at grandmother's house. Grandmother doesn't want people jumping on her sofa. And then she says, no, mom, I need to jump on the sofa. I was having so much fun. And you say, I know, you've got a lot of energy. Maybe we can do something else with all that energy. Would you show your grandmother how you can, I don't know, do jumping jacks? Um, how many can you do? Or how, how you can jump? Give them something to do that's physical where they're getting the adult attention. Because maybe one of the reasons she was jumping is that she wanted her mother and her grandmother to stop talking to each other and to talk to her or to look at her or to notice her. So you give her some attention and then you, and you help her work out her physical energy. And then you say, okay, I am going to talk with your grandmother a little more and we're going to have food soon. But right now, right now, what can you do that is okay to do in grandmother's apartment? We brought, we brought a book for you. We brought some paper and some, some, um, some, you know, art things for you that are safe to use. You know, we'll find a safe place on a table. May, you know, maybe there's a little tray that she keeps her art things on so that she, they don't get over onto the table. You know, she's not drawing on the table. And you find something to get her to be busy, but, you know, near you so she can see you. Maybe even it's a, you're not going to have a private conversation. She can listen to you talk. She's next to you, and you can even say things. While you're chatting with grandmother, you can say to your daughter, oh, I see you're using a lot of blue today. And she, she feels like, wow, I'm being noticed. You're not saying, oh, blue is the best color. Always use blue. You're saying, I see you're using blue. If it were red, I see you're using a lot of red today. There's no judgment. There's no evaluation. You're just noticing, right? So now she's getting her needs met, right? So what you notice, there's a combination of all of these three big ideas. The first thing you did was calm yourself down. The second thing you did was connect with her. And the third thing you did was help her with the feelings that were creating the problem behavior. So the feelings were, I'm full of energy, I want to do something, nobody's paying any attention to me, right? So you were able to help her with those feelings, all of them. And now everything's back to a smooth place. Whereas what if you had instead gone and shouted at her? She would have been angry. She would have still felt the same way. No one pays any attention to me. And... I have all this energy and I don't know what to do with it. And she would have been angry and she would have acted angry. And you would have gotten more embarrassed. And then you would have shouted more, right? And then you would have embarrassed yourself more by shouting more. You know, 
this is a whole different approach where, and parents might say, but she still has to learn not to jump on the sofa. You're right. And you just told her. And she probably already knew it, in fact. She just needed help with the feelings that were driving her to jump on the sofa. Well, first we should recognize what the word means. The word discipline is from the same root as the word disciple. A disciple is a teacher, a teacher. And so, you know, they're, they're a follower of maybe a guru or a, or a, a religious leader, um, but they are a teacher. That's what disciple means, to learn and to teach. So if we're learning and teaching and the child is learning from us, does punishment help them learn? Many parents might say yes, but actually the research shows it does not. The research shows that when we are punished, we get angry and we get defensive and we don't learn. So let's say um, that you um, make something for dinner and you put too much salt in it. I've done that many times. I put too much salt in it. And let's say your husband says to you, this is terrible. This food is just awful. Don't you know anything about how to cook? This is full of salt. How could you do this? I would feel punished. I would feel yelled at, right? I would feel humiliated. I would feel unappreciated. After all, I just made a big dinner. And it would not make me want to be, I might want to be a better cook to show him, but I wouldn't make me more, more um, interested in doing a good job cooking. And in fact, it would damage my relationship with my husband. It would make me feel like, well, I don't want to be close to him, right? That's what happens with our children when we punish. When we punish our children, they don't want to be close to us. They might want to show us, but it's not by doing a good job, right? It's by maybe, maybe in the case of the child jumping on the sofa, the minute we leave the room, she'll go back and jump on the sofa again just to show us, right? So they, we want to prove ourselves right. We get defensive. We get angry. And when we're defensive, we can't take in new information. We can't learn. And we're not open to changing or to anyone's influence. Whereas guidance, teaching, when we're teaching a child, it, again, the, the sofa, what did we just teach that child? We taught her, no, you don't jump on the sofa when you go visiting, number one. Number two, we taught her when you have all that energy, there are other ways to use that energy. No, you, you feel like you have a lot of energy, don't you? There are other ways to use that energy. And we taught her she can get attention from the grown-ups in other ways that are more constructive. We taught her that also. And we did it all without punishing her. She didn't feel like a bad person. You know, children will always, as I said, exhibit childish behavior. That doesn't mean they're bad people. It means they're children. And when we make someone feel like a bad person for the rest of their life, that voice we use with them stays in our head. So if you ever stop and you listen to the voice in your head, sometimes that voice in your head is very mean. And it says things to you like, you're so stupid. How could you do such a thing wrong? You made that terrible mistake. You never do anything right. That's a, not a good voice to have in your head. And where would such a voice come from? It comes from our childhoods. It comes from the way we were treated in childhood. If we feel like we're bad, we repeat that in our minds. And that is not a way. We, we, the research shows that when you talk to yourself that way, you're less happy. You're less confident right? And you're less able to give love to other people because you're less loving to yourself. You're less loving to anyone else. And you're less able to receive love. You, you may feel unloved, but you're not giving yourself love. So your heart is closed off and defended. You can't receive love. So you don't feel, you don't have as good relationships. So we don't want to do that to our children, right? That punishment creates a, um, a mind, Punishment creates a way of thinking that is ultimately damaging to our children and makes them less happy and less um, having good relationships for the rest of their lives, less confident, less successful. So, 
So what happens to your child when you yell? It's scary. When you have a two-year-old or a three-year-old and you yell at them, you shout at them, it's scary. Because think about it from their point of view. You're the center of their universe. You're the person who feeds them. You're the person who shelters them, gives them a, a, a place to, to live. and to, You're the person who protects them if someone ever tried to hurt them. You're their source of safety and love. And then all of a sudden, imagine your source of safety and love. Maybe it would be your partner, your husband or wife. Maybe it would be some, if you, if you have a parent you're close to, might be somebody who's a source of safety and love for you. Now imagine that person all of a sudden starts yelling at you, but they're not just who they are. Imagine that they're much, much taller than you. They're three or four times your height, right? And they could just pick you up and hurt you if they wanted. They're not necessarily going to, but imagine they could. And they're yelling and shouting at you. How would you feel? You would feel scared. And your body would go into a state of emergency. It would be fight, flight, or freeze. And you would either run away and hide under the bed, right? Or you would get angry and try to fight back. If you could, if you were a strong-willed child, you might do that. Or you might, some, some parents will say to me, my child didn't even look guilty. Their face just went blank when I yelled at them. That's fear. That's actually, when I say fight, flight, or freeze, that's freeze. When you just freeze because somebody is scaring you, right? And you're, you're scared of this parent who is yelling at you. If the parent says anything to you at that moment, like, you stupid child, or don't you, you know, you know better than this, or um, you're always making mistakes, the child will take that in at a very deep level, and they will remember that for the rest of their lives, even unconsciously, it will shape how they feel about themselves. So it, it hurts their self-esteem. But even if the parent doesn't use hurtful language, even if they just scream, oh, I can't believe it, this is so terrible, how could you have done this, right? Even that, the child takes it in as they're the cause of their parents' upset. There must be something very wrong with them that they can't even have their parent love them, that they once again messed up. Is, is the child learning from this, don't do that wrong thing, whatever it was, like leave their toys around? Maybe the child left their toys around and the parent stepped on the toy and it really hurt the parent's foot. And the parent screams, totally understandable. I think it's probably happened to every parent at least once. We, we scream, ouch, that's fine, that's fine. And then you stop, drop, and breathe. You calm yourself down. And then you pick up the toy and you turn to your child and you say, this does not belong where people are walking. That really hurt my foot. Where does this go? And the child says, I'm on the shelf. And you say, okay, can you put it on the shelf? And the child puts it on the shelf. That child learns something. But if you just instead scream at the child, why did you leave this toy here? You know better than that. You throw the, the child. Let's say you throw the toy. You're so angry. You throw the toy. The toy breaks or it doesn't break doesn't matter. What if you just role modeled for your child? You've role modeled that the way you solve problems is by throwing a tantrum. You have a tantrum. You, you scream, you know, something happens, you don't like it. You scream, you throw the thing, you yell at the person involved. So your child has just learned something very important. It was not what you were trying to teach, but absolutely it is what they learn. The way to solve problems, the way grown ups solve problems is to scream and yell and throw things and have a tantrum. And I don't think that's what we want to be teaching them. And I don't think it's what we want to be living with. I think we have to recognize that both people in the interaction have needs at that moment. We need to just have a little bit of chill out time, right, to regroup because work was hard today. And the child really needs us because they haven't seen us all day. And the question is whose needs get met first. And we, we have to get our needs met. But the child has to get their needs met first, right? The child is still a child. The child didn't ask to be born. The child needs the parent. And if you don't give them some connection time, what will end up happening is the child will be, they will have um, big feelings of feeling unseen, unloved, and they will act those feelings out 
and they will be unlovable, <laughs> which means they will misbehave all evening until bedtime, and they'll be worse tomorrow, right? So that's not any way to approach the evening, right? We need to meet their needs, just like we, we wouldn't not feed them dinner. We feed them dinner, that's a need. Well, we also, and we get them to bed on time, sleep is a need. We also give them our loving attention because that's an important need. Connection, without that connection, children don't cooperate, but they also don't feel safe. They don't feel safe, they don't really relax, and they don't thrive. They don't, um, they're not able to cope with what life throws at them. They get more anxious because they don't feel safe. So it's very important that they do get the connection. So what I tell mothers and fathers is, your child will need you when you get home. That's kid time. That's child time. So before you leave your workplace, you know, if you're in the office, you know, you just take a few minutes at your desk and you do some breathing. If you're a doctor, you know, or you're working in a hospital, you, you, you know, probably don't have a desk or someplace you can sit down, but you find a private place, a place where you can just sit down and breathe for a few minutes, just a few minutes and get yourself centered. If you can change into more casual clothing, you know, that's even better. If you've had a business suit on and you can change, I say to the parents in the United States, take off your business suit and put on your blue jeans before you leave the office because you'll already be in a more relaxed frame of mind by the time you see your child. And then you're either picking your child up at daycare often here in the United States or you're walking in the house. Maybe you've had a nanny with them, but you're walking in your house and there's your children. And you, before you walk in the door, you just stop and you take care of yourself for a minute. You check in with you. You just stop and you you feel your body and you say, it's going to be pandemonium in there. It's going to be chaos. It's going to be crazy. It's okay. They need me. I'm going to take care of them. I'm going to give them my love. Once they go to bed, I will take some time for me. I will do what I need. What do I need? Oh, I need just to relax. I need a hot bath. I need to just watch TV for a few minutes. I just need to connect with my husband. I need to pay those bills and get them without so I'm not worried about them. Whatever you need, you can do it after the kids go to bed. But check in with yourself. Promise yourself that you'll take care of you once the kids go to bed. And then when you do walk into the door, put your things down and hug your kids and get them laughing. And why do I say get them laughing? Well, because we know it changes the body chemistry. We know that when we have, when we're at the end of the day, every human being from babies to adults, every human being has stress hormones in their body that they didn't have when they woke up that morning. They have a higher level of stress hormones. Why is that? It's, it's because we've gotten stressed out throughout our day and we haven't worked it all out. Much of that happens during sleep. That's why sleep is so important. So when we laugh, it reduces those stress hormones. So we're in a better mood. We personally are in a better mood and the child is in a better mood. This is a way to take care of both us and the child. And the other thing it does, when you laugh with another person, it turns out, science tells us, we release oxytocin. Oxytocin is the bonding hormone. So when we laugh with another person, we're bonding with them. So you come in the door, you pick your children up, you swing them around, I'm next, I'm next, and you pick that one up and swing them around. Maybe you've already got your, your casual clothes on, that's a good thing. You know, you put away your briefcase, your, your bags, and you come over to the children and you're with the children for a few minutes and you just, you, see, you say, I'm so happy to see. Sometimes parents will say, because they don't know what else to say, they'll say, how was school today? But you don't even have to do that. Most children are like, school, that was a long time ago. Or, you know, they don't. it's like a whole thing to think about. They're just happy to see you. So just connect in the moment. Just say, I am so happy to see you, to see you. I missed you today. Wow, I love seeing your beautiful brown eyes and your beautiful brown eyes. Oh, I have the best kids in the world. I am so lucky to be your mother. Now, you've just connected. Your kids feel seen. They feel like they're special. They matter. Somebody really cares about them. And you know, their teacher may care about them. Their nanny may care about them. Their friends may care about them. They may care about each other. But nobody is their mother and father except the mother and father. Only the mother and father really see the child and are on their side in the same way. 
And every child needs that. They need to know you're there every single day in that way. And then after you spend 15 minutes and they're laughing and you're throwing them around or you're playing on the sofa together and, you know, you're having a good time with them and everyone's laughing. And then you take a deep breath and you say, you know what? I need to eat something. What are we going to do now? And maybe they've already been fed or maybe they come in with you and they eat with you now or maybe they come in with you even though they've already eaten. Or maybe you're going to eat later after you put them to bed. Whatever it is, you move on to the next thing in the schedule. You may be giving them a bath or reading them a story before bed. Or maybe you're all sitting down to dinner together to, to eat. Whatever it is, you can now move them into the evening schedule. But first, you have to connect. Quality time does matter, right? It matters that you connect with your child. What I just described was quality time, right? It's, it's essential. But if that's all you ever did, was spend that 15 minutes and then you gave your children back to the nanny and you went out to dinner with your husband and you did that every night, that's not going to work for your child. 15 minutes is not enough, even if it's high quality time. So that's what I mean by quality time is a myth. I think that often we're in a problem in, it's been true in the United States for a while now and it's certainly true for the parents who you work with at Parent Circle. Parent, when the mother works outside the home and the father works outside the home, they're both very busy. And I, I think it's wonder. I, I do work outside the home, and I did even when my children were little. Not in the first couple of years, but after that, I did. And I, I think many parents don't have a choice. I had a choice, right, that I could stay home some of the time and that I could work part-time some of the time. But parents often don't even have a choice. They have to work outside the home because otherwise, how do they pay for their apartment or whatever? So... I don't want parents to feel bad about, I, I do not think women need to stay home. I do not think that. I think men need to step up more and be more involved, first of all, in the morning and at night, I think, and on weekends, men need to be more involved. It should not fall all on a woman's shoulders. That's very clear because A, children need their dads, and B, women can't do it by themselves when they're working outside the home and also at home with the children. They can't do it all. And so men need to be more involved than often is the case. But also, I think we just can't do everything. So an example would be cooking. I would say that if you're working outside the home, you can't come home and cook. You don't have time. You, you want to come home and connect with your child. So either someone else has to cook or you buy some food that's prepared, or you eat very simply. Maybe, you know, you have the most simple food. Maybe you have leftovers from yesterday. Maybe you make food on the weekend and you eat it through the week, you know, but you eat simply instead of trying to cook anything elaborate. I often find that, that women expect themselves to cook an elaborate meal, even when they worked all day at, outside the home. And it's just not possible to do everything. So I would say when your children are young, they need you more. When they're older, they don't need you as much. You can do other things then. But right now when they're young, your priority is to take care of your children and to connect with them and to take care of yourself, to stay in communication with your partner so that your marriage doesn't fall apart, and to work on your job. But you can't do other extra things. Any, and I say anything you can if you have the money to pay somebody to do it, do it. You know, if you can buy prepared food, if you can pay someone to clean your house, absolutely do it because you can only do, there's only, we're given each 24 hours in the day. That is it. And your children need a lot of it. I, I want to just say one other thing about this. Women need, women are mostly need something outside the home. They're not happy just staying home with their children because in our culture, it's not a tribal village anymore where you would have other women to be cooking with all day and chatting with and gathering food and gardening with, right? We don't have that anymore with our children all running around us together. Instead, we're all in individual apartments and in individual jobs. And we, we I th well, forget the jobs. We're in individual apartments and we get lonely, when we're just by ourselves. No one should have to raise children by themselves. And so I think most women do like to work outside the home at least some of the time because it's fulfilling. And that's great. That's great. But your children 
deserve you. If you're choosing to have children, know that it's going to be a lot of time. It's just a lot of time to, to engage with children. And we should tell the truth about what women need, right? They should not be forced to stay home and cook and clean if they don't want to do that. But we should also tell the truth about what children need. What children need is connection with their special adults. And sometimes they do have a special nanny who was there from the time they were born and stays with the family a very long time and she's like a family member. But most of the time that's not the case anymore. At least in the United States it's not. And I think really all over the world that's changing. And so I think really um, they need connection with their parents no matter what if you want influence with them. And so I would just say let's tell the truth about what children need and let's give it to them. And let's find a way to support mothers better so that they also get their needs met. Well, the, the biggest impediment these days to connecting with our children is our addiction to our gadgets, right? When we're always looking at our phone, the child senses we're not available to them. You know, we've all had it happen that we're, we're, in our home, maybe we're washing the dishes and the child is playing with their little brother or sister. It's all fine. And it's all good. And then suddenly, when we, we, the, we get on our phone and suddenly, what are the children doing? They're fighting with each other. Now, why is that? Because we're not available. Because children, their, um, their genetics are still from the Stone Age. And when an adult who's responsible for them is not available to protect them, they worry on some level they don't feel safe. They feel disconnected. They're not safe. What if a tiger jumped out of the bushes? Now, I know there's no tigers in your apartment, but they, their genetics worry. Like, no one's here to protect me. Before she was doing the dishes, no problem. If, if a tiger jumped out, she would see it. She, she's available. She was doing the dishes, but when you're doing the dishes, you're hearing, you're seeing, you're noticing your kids. But all of a sudden, when you're on your phone, you know how we all are. We don't notice anything. We're just noticing the phone. So your child doesn't feel safe, and they act up. And so I think our own phone addictions are the biggest problem, and we have to be self-disciplined about it. We have to acknowledge that phones are, are they're addictive. They are designed to be addictive. They're designed to keep us on them for longer. All social media is designed to keep you on the social media for longer. Even the way the phone is designed, where when you get a text, there's a little ding, ding, when you get a text, that's, you get a little dopamine rush. So your neurotransmitters interact with the phone the same way that any other addiction does. You know, when you take certain medications or drugs that are mind altering, like opium, you know, opiates, they do something, right, where they engage with your physiology to release things, natural opiates in your system, right? And that's one of the reasons for the addiction. Well, guess what? Phones are not so different. Phones interact with our bodies and cause us to release dopamine when we see, it. oh, here's a new text, here's an email, and we see it on our phone, right, when somebody calls us. So it's an addiction. So we just need to recognize that. You know, we can have a phone or a device, but we have to know that it's designed to be addictive and if we put it before our child, what message are we giving our child? So I, I tell parents, when you come in the house at night, plug your phone in and turn it off or turn off the, the, the sound and turn it over and do not look at it. That may not be enough for some people. Research has shown that if you can still see your phone, even if it's not on or if it's not ringing, you still have, you, you, ha you have an impulse to check it over and over again. If that's the case, put it away. Turn it off, literally, and put it in a drawer. That's it. And do not get it out again until your children are asleep. There's no reason you need your phone out. If your children are with you, there's no emergency that someone's calling, right? If your mother calls, she can call back later. It's really okay. Unless someone's in the hospital or you have reason to believe there will be an emergency call, you don't need your phone out at that point. The adults can take care of themselves. You're with your children, right? So I think that's the most important thing to remember. The other thing is that people use gadgets, devices, to keep their children busy. And we're setting up an early addiction with our children. 
Children don't need devices before they are, well, before they're using phones when they're teenagers, they need a phone because they're sometimes not with you or with a responsible adult and they need a phone or they need a computer to do their work, uh, their schoolwork. Before that age, they do not need devices at all. We use them to keep children busy. Now, I have no problem if you're on, a, on an airplane with your child and you want to give them the iPad to watch a movie, of course, that's fine. And I would even say if you and your partner, your husband want to have an, a discussion or some quiet time alone on a Saturday morning, you can do that and you can let your child watch a screen. That's fine. But if your child is on a screen every single day, that's an addiction. It's not a special occasion. So I would say keep screens for special occasions. And that means the parent has to say no a lot because they're addictive and the child will cry and whine and want it. But the research shows that screens make us anxious. They make adults anxious the more you're on a screen. And they make children anxious the more children are on the screen. And so if you can avoid giving the child the screen, you're lowering their anxiety level. And research also shows that when children are on screens more, they're less creative. They're less original. They're less able to play independently by themselves. If you want your child to learn to play by themselves, do not give them a screen, ever. Before you ever give a child a video game, you would sign an agreement about how often they're allowed to use it, when they're allowed to use it, and when they turn it off, what the, what the procedure is, because it's very hard to turn it off. We all know it's very hard to tear ourselves away from a screen that we're involved in. Even if you don't play video games, you probably, if you're watching a movie, it's very hard to tear yourself away. Or if the show ends and you want to see the next one, we call it binge watching here. I don't know if India, yes, it's called yes, the same thing. Yes, yes. yes. So binge watching. So we know it's very hard and we can't expect a nine-year-old to tear himself away from the screen when he's playing a video game. So we have to have a way where there's a timer and the timer goes off. And he knows, okay, only five more minutes, and we reset it for five minutes. And then at the end of that, when either he turns it off or we have to turn it off, and then there's something he has to do. And usually the best thing is to move physically. So he has to get up and run around three times around the room or do 10 jumping jacks or something that is, or maybe he gets some time to roughhouse with his mother or father and laugh. But something that he uses physical energy to do. Because otherwise, he won't be able to switch gears away from the computer. So that's so you plan all this out in advance, and you practice it. And then the first day the child has the video game, you say, it's going to be hard to turn it off, but we're going to do it. So it just binged. It said, ding, and now it's five more minutes. And you'll need it because he's been on it 15 minutes already, let's say. And now he has five more minutes. And you say, so it's going to be time to turn it off. How will you make it easier? That's right. We're going to do some roughhousing afterwards. So we're going to do some laughing or you're going to show me something. You're, we're going to do, you know, we're going to get out your musical instrument. And you're going to show me something, something that the child wants to do. Um, and then at the end of that five minutes, they will beg you for more time. They will always say, please, I just need to get to the next level. I've almost got this. Oh, you interrupted me and I almost had it. They're going to be angry at you, right? And you say, I know, sweetie, it's so frustrating. It's very hard to turn it off. But I know you can handle this. If you're, old, if you're old enough to play the video game, you're old enough to handle turning it off. If you're ready to play, I would just say, if you're ready to play the video game, you're ready to handle turning it off. So I know you can handle this. Let's work together. Do you want me to turn it off or do you want you to turn it off? And if they, they are, no, no, you can say, all right, then let's get up from the chair. Let's move away. And you turn it off as they're getting up and moving away. You turn it off and then you move on to the next thing in your day. And then later, once they've calmed down, you say to them, you know, it was really hard for you to turn your game off. I know. It's very hard. You know, the corporations who make these games, they design them so you never want to get off. That's not fair, is it? Because you've got other things you have to do in life. You have to come to dinner. You have to do your homework. You have to have fun with your parents and your little brother. And your child might say, no, I just want to play my video game. And you say, I know, because that's how it's designed. That's how addiction works. And the way addiction works, we give up the things that are important to us, right, to do that addiction, even though it's not ultimately what we value. What we value is our family. What we value is doing a good job in school. But we give those things up 
because of the addiction. So if you're ready to have a video game, then you're ready to turn it off yourself and to handle turning it off. If you're not able to do that without yelling at me, sweetheart, then you're not ready for the game. And then they don't get the game. Not It's not punitive. It's not punishment. It's, it's they're earning this privilege by how they handle it. It's not a punishment. I want to just tell parents, sometimes consequences turn into punishments. Parents will say, all right, you won't get any more video games then. That's not what I'm saying because that's a different tone of voice and it's a different attitude. What I'm saying is you're the partner. You're the partner with the child. You're the managing partner, but you're the partner. And so if the child can't handle it, actually, they're not ready for it. You don't have to be punitive. You just say, you know, when you're ready. It's like you wouldn't let them walk on the street themselves until they're ready. Well, you wouldn't let them have a video game until they're ready either. So first of all, when parents have a second baby, they, they're so happy, of course, and they expect the child to be happy. But children have complicated feelings about that second baby, even if they're happy they still worry that maybe the parents will like the second baby more. Maybe the parents don't love them so much anymore. And they worry, right? Sometimes they're just angry. And they need help with those feelings. And if you don't help them, then you'll have to help them later because they will be mean to the baby, or at least when the baby gets a little older and is a toddler and is getting into their things and is crawling around, they will get angry then and they'll be mean to the baby. So you do have to help them with those feelings. So my sibling book has three sections in it. The last section, because some people are past this stage, is when you have the new baby and for the first year. And it has all the information parents need to make that an easy transition for the older child or children, as well as for them. So that's the, that's the last section of the book. But it's there for everybody who has a baby coming or has a, has a one-year-old. But also... Also, the other two parts of the book are for older kids. So the second part, the middle part of the book, is teaching children skills, teaching children the skills to navigate conflict. Because in every human relationship, there is conflict. You have two different human beings with two different sets of needs. There will be conflict. So the idea of this teaching is to teach children that they can express what they need without attacking their sibling. Right? So you don't have to hit your sibling to get what you want. You don't have to yell at your sibling. You don't have to push them. You don't have to, to be to tease them and be mean to them. You can just say, I need this. I want that. Or what you're doing, I'm finding really annoying when you're singing at the top of your lungs like that. It's too loud for me to read. You know, um, you can just say what you need without attacking the sibling and saying, Stop that right now. I hate it when you sing, right? You can just say what you need. So that's the whole second part of the book, is teaching kids those skills. And the first part of the book takes the three big ideas about self-regulation, connection, and coaching, and it applies them to siblings. And it's true for every parent who has a second child. How do you use these ideas? Because it turns out that when a parent has a better connection with their older child, the older child is nicer to the young one. When a parent is able to help the older child with all of their big feelings about having a new baby, and when they're able to meet the child's needs, to still feel important, to be seen, to be validated, that child is nicer to the second child because they're, they feel they get help with their big emotions. They don't have to be mean. And of course, when you are able to self-regulate as a parent, you're modeling for your children how to solve problems in a peaceful way. So they fight with each other less. So... That's what the sibling book is. Well, every child is different. But a child will show you whether they're happy. A child will show you whether they're thriving. And by thriving, I mean they can handle the appropriate challenges that come with every age. So if they're learning to use the toilet when they're little, or if they're learning to eat by themselves, or if they're learning to dress themselves, or if they're a little older and they're making friends and learning how to have friendships, or they're going to school and they're learning how to handle the assignments and to sit in class and do what the teacher asks. 
All of these things are normal things to ask of children, sleeping in their own bed at night, eventually. But we, we, I guess we just want to have children be able to handle those things. And if they aren't handling those things, they need a little support. So they're the best parenting expert because if your child is having a hard time with any of these things, maybe they're socially a little anxious when they meet other children. We can support the child and the child will show us where they need support, right? It's that simple. The child is the expert. They'll show us what's working. They'll show us what's not working. Sometimes the answer is obvious, right? They need more time from us or they need more connection um, or we need to stop shouting at them. But sometimes the answer is not so obvious. Hmm, why does she have a hard time when she meets other children and she gets anxious and worried? Well, maybe she was just born that way, but maybe we can teach her some skills so she's more confident when she interacts with her peers, right? Because, you know, children all need different things from us, but she's, she's the expert on what she needs. She will show us what she needs.